under the cover. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. Thank you, Minister Tracy, for singing that song for us, Under the Cover. Just to let you know, she does not make me call her that at home. I get to call her sweetheart or just Tracy at home. Our focus of today's message is in alignment with the second saying of a gracist. I will cover you, being under the cover. Would you consider covering me even today in prayer? And I'd like us to go to the Lord in prayer, and in particular, not only pray for our service today, but pray for those in Israel and Palestine with what's going on in Gaza. Let's pray. God of light and salvation, our refuge and our strength, we pray for the people of Israel and Palestine amid the escalating violence. We pray for the families of those killed and we pray for those injured by rockets from Gaza and southern Israel. May your rod and staff comfort them. God of all comfort, we pray for those who are grieving. May they know your ever-present help. We pray for the protection of those who have been taken hostage. As they walk through this dark valley, may they fear no evil. We pray for civilians. May they know that their help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. And we pray for those in leadership in Gaza and Israel. May you guide them along the right paths. And now, Lord, as we turn to your word, we beg that you would renew our minds, that you'd give us a fresh filling of your spirit, that you would transform our lives. And we ask all this in union with Christ and trusting in the power of your Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Cover me. Perhaps you've heard that said in a movie when someone needs to lay down cover fire in order to protect someone else. Maybe you've had a bill that needed to be paid, been at a restaurant, and you didn't have enough to cover it. And you ask someone if they would cover you. Can you cover me here? Have you ever felt in the midst of making a mistake or kind of being out there and being exposed that you needed some form of covering? Whether it's a spiritual mistake or whether it's a cultural mistake, not understanding cultural nuances, maybe a social mistake. I mean, I even thought about that today. I wondered, as I got dressed today, am I making a social mistake? <laughs> By that response, I think maybe yes. <laughs> but I put on these black jeans, and my thighs are a little bigger than the pants are. <laughs> and so they, they tend to ride up on me. A little bit. Now, I, I know all the kids are doing it, and that's the trend today, that it's okay to let your pants ride up just a little bit. But I'm a product of the 70s and the 80s. And those of you who, oh, those of you who kind of go back with me, you know that those were called flutters. <laughs> and I'm kind of going back to my third grade days and because I'm the youngest of four boys, getting hand-me-down clothes and walking down the hallway of my school and having someone say, hey, Coiro, where's the flood? <laughs> so when I put these pants on today, I just thought, you know what? Of all Sundays, couldn't I just ask the congregation to cover me today? <laughs> to just cover me? 
And to cover someone means that you don't expose it, you just keep it hidden. You conceal it. Thank you for your covering. I appreciate it. I know covering can carry a lot of different meanings, both biblically and in our culture as well. The idea of covering is to, is to shield someone else or to let a mistake go by. I play some racket sports. I play some tennis. I play some pickleball. And mostly I'm playing doubles now. And, and if I make a mistake, something that I like to hear is no worries. I don't like to get the stink eye when I make a mistake. <laughs> and when my partner makes an error, I also like to say no worries. If I make a mistake, I want to take ownership for that. And I'll say, my bad, no worries. That's covering one another. Uh, this word carries the idea of shielding another too. Tracy and I ride bikes quite a bit. Uh, we just took a bike ride on the B&A. Any of you ever ridden bikes on the B&A? The pathway? It's a lot of fun to do that. And sometimes uh, we'll ride side by side, but if another bike or walkers are coming toward us, we'll need to go single file. Well, I like getting behind her because she shields the wind from me. <laughs> and I can tuck in right behind her rear wheel, and I'm being shielded or I'm being covered. So that's an advantage to me. You may have noticed uh, in the baseball playoffs that when a, when a pitcher throws a pitch and the hitter crushes the ball, there are times, I saw this uh, in, in the Orioles series, the outfielder will just stand there and watch the ball go over his head. And what he's doing when he does that is he's exposing the pitcher as having thrown a horrible pitch. And the pitcher will get mad if he does something like that. Or if a defensive player makes a miscue, a misplay, an error, if the pitcher shows frustration about that or slams his glove into his hand, then that's sort of exposing or showing up someone else. But instead, we're supposed to cover one another. So when Lamar Jackson throws a perfect pass and it goes right through the hands of, I, I won't say his name because I don't want to expose him, there's an opportunity for a response there. Does Lamar go up and tap him on the helmet and say, no worries, you get the next one? That's covering him. Or does he show some level of frustration? I think we're called to cover one another. And in some ways today, I want to contrast cover culture with cancel culture. You heard of that? You heard of cancel culture? It's the phenomenon or practice of publicly rejecting, boycotting, or ending support for particular people or groups because of their socially or morally unacceptable views or actions. Urban Outfitters, GoDaddy, Amazon, Facebook, Dove, Bud Light, and many, many more have all experienced the impact of cancel culture. It also reaches to individuals as well as people can get canceled. Christians can get canceled. Churches can get canceled based on a, a misstep, a misinterpretation, maybe something that sparked something on social media, or maybe even a sin in the camp, or maybe just a rumor. What's the biblical response to social media mistakes within a cancel culture? Listen to what Paul says 
as he is mentoring a young pastor, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 26. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses. I, I think the idea here is there's no sense or value in engaging publicly. Does that mean that you never confront or what we might want to say, care front and move towards someone? Yes, of course, but let's do that in privacy and let's do that with the right mindset of Galatians 6, 1 and 2 and restore gently and thus fulfill the law of Christ. It, it was Paul that was, that was advising and counseling the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, there was someone who had committed a heinous sin. And Paul said, you need to turn that person over to Satan. You're tolerating it. But in 2 Corinthians, by that point, the person had repented. And Paul said, actually move toward them in order to comfort them, lest they become overwhelmed by sorrow. So even when those in our midst make mistakes, missteps, even if they are sin, when they do turn the corner or respond to carefrontation, then we are to actually move toward them. You see, it's possible for well-intentioned believers to take the otherwise legitimate concepts of reputation, respect, and community and revert to an unbiblical extreme honor-shame approach. We can and should resist cancel culture by perhaps first having the humility to accept the differences of opinion of others. Uh, maybe two, approaching disagreements with reason and caution. And three, maybe allowing for the possibility of redemption or a change of heart. So what's the opposite of cancel culture? It's a cover culture. A cover culture is needed in our context of a society here in America. And it's absolutely needed as we seek to do multicultural, diverse community and doing life deeply with one another. Do you know, it's, it's been pointed out that multicultural growth requires risk-taking. If I'm in a cancel culture, or if I'm afraid that I'm going to be canceled, I am not going to take the risk that I might be stepping on a landmine. And in doing that, what happens is I remain isolated and self-protected because I don't know how you're going to respond. Because in cancel culture, I can be canceled for saying the wrong thing. And you know what? I can also be canceled for not saying anything because it could be viewed as being disinterested or complicit. But in our context... We need to have a cover culture so that we can truly engage in difficult conversations. In my particular life group that I lead on Friday mornings at 6.30 a.m., we have, over the years, been privileged to talk about very difficult topics, like the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the death of black men across this country, people like George Floyd. And in doing that, we become enriched because we get to empathize and know the struggle, the fears, the culture, the background, the flinch factors, the triggers of our other brothers in Christ. 
So by having this multicultural context, which does demand a cover culture, you then have the permission to engage in things and maybe even make mistakes and get covered for those. Oh, we do have to cover each other, don't we? Because we're, we're sort of all on different levels of maturity as it comes to social maturity, cultural maturity, and spiritual maturity. I mean, I've been here about 12 years now at Bridgeway, but when I was, I was newer here, I was leading a meeting, and I was getting ready to start the meeting, and uh, we were getting ready to start. It was maybe a minute after the start time, and an African-American gentleman walked in the rear of the room and, and said, uh, let's get going. What are we on, color people time? And I thought, well, that's interesting. Everyone laughed, and so I went to my cultural advisor, <laughs> Steve, and I said, that was funny. Can, can I use that? And he said, oh, no, you don't, you don't, you don't want to go there. You don't want to use that. And I was like, okay. So he covered me, and it, but it was in a context of grace where I was able to ask a question like that. And you know what? A decade later, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I was with my Bible study just recently, and Marshall, African-American, he comes in a little bit early. Bill Green, African-American, he's in there. Marshall has a bright yellow shirt on. And I say, hey, Marshall, you're looking yellow today. <laughs> now, some of you know what happened in that moment. I had no idea what was happening in that moment. Marshall fell out laughing. Tears were coming down his cheeks. Bill Green engaged in that. Those of us who were kind of ignorant about what was going on, we started laughing just because these guys were falling out. And then it was explained to me that an oftentimes disparaging title for someone who was a light-skinned black person was high yellow. We all had a good laugh, but more than that, we all grew in our understanding of the cultural nuances. See, that could have been stepping on a landmine for me, and I could have gotten canceled right there. But if you're in a cover culture, you allow for the grace of those who are not as far along as you spiritually or socially or culturally, and you make allowances for that. Oh, would you agree with me that we need to cover one another? So let me just define this word cover for you biblically. The word that I'm referencing and the way that it's applied, the sense of the word in the New Testament, really only appears twice. In James chapter 5, verse 20, but then again in 1 Peter 4, 8. I'll get to that verse later on, but I at least want to define the word cover for you. Kelpto is the word, and it means to hide or conceal or to keep secret. We are commanded by Peter. It's an imperative. We are commanded to cover one another. It means to shield or to screen or to protect. Have you ever felt vulnerable, exposed, embarrassed after a mistake? Maybe it was wrong what you did, or maybe it was just an unknowing misstep. And it does become important. I'll use the spiritual metaphor, but you know that this applies to social maturity and it also to cultural maturity. But from a spiritual standpoint, we need to cover one another. Do you, do you know, when you transferred your trust over to Jesus Christ, you became a believer. And in John chapter 3, Jesus uses the term to describe what happened to you is that you were born again. When you're born again, you are a child. And your, your spiritual life has just begun. 
And you may be a long way from reaching maturity. Well, what if those who are further along than you engage with you while you are still rather immature as a believer? How can that be handled? You see, I believe our salvation comes to us in, let's say, three stages. When you trust Christ, you're declared righteous. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your account. But you're not perfected yet. That's not going to happen until glorification. So you've got justification when you receive Christ and glorification way over here when you're made perfect in him. And there may be quite a gap in between those two. For me, it's been 42 years already. So what is that process in between? You've got justification over here and glorification over here. In the middle, you've got sanctification, where we're learning more and more to live like Christ. Like what John would say in 1 John 2, 6, anyone who claims to have life in Jesus must walk as Jesus did. So I'm trying to get more and more like Jesus. But that didn't happen on day one. My friends, when I was a month old in the Lord, I showed up by God's sovereign design on a very conservative Christian college campus, one month old in the Lord. And I was in a unit with seven other guys, all of them graduates of conservative Christian high schools. And we're on a very conservative Christian college. They didn't know what to do with me. You know, I was raised in a, in a, in a secular home and my language wasn't sanctified yet. <laughs> Tracy might tell you it's still not sanctified <laughs> yet. But I remember early on in my tenure there, I, I was a tennis recruit. I played on the tennis team. And our, our tennis coach, Dr. Murdoch, was also the department chairman of the social sciences department. And there was a student in my unit Mark was his name, and Mark really admired Dr. Murdoch. Uh, he wanted to go into, into social studies, and he wanted to be a professor someday. So he was very intrigued about Dr. Murdoch. So he would ask me, you know, tell me about Dr. Murdoch. He had read his books and all this stuff. And I said, oh, he's a hell of a nice guy. <laughs> Folks, at Cedarville University, a conservative Christian college, that's not the kind of language that gets thrown around. So what did these guys do? Well, in some ways, they had the maturity to, to know what to do with me. They covered me, and they allowed for that growth process in my life. We need to cover others who may not be at the level of maturity or sanctification that we are at. Allow for mistakes. In bridge building, there's an entire gamut of living multiculturally that you go through, all the way from bigot to bridge builder and everything in between. We need to allow for people who have a desire to grow in multiculturalism to go to move along that and help them in that journey. So regardless of what it is, whether it's someone moving from a child in the Lord to then being a reproducing Christian, having reached maturity, now they understand that they are not just a disciple, but they are to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And we need to allow for that growth process. Let's do that. I mean, there are some commands in the New Testament that are so clear about this. Bear with one another. Accept one another. Forgive one another, even as God through Christ has forgiven you. That's the standard. Let's do well. An Old Testament illustration that I, I think models this well for us is found in Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse 18, we have sort of the closing story on the last 350 years of Noah's life. The sons of Noah came out of the ark. Who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. 
These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Now you can kind of imagine how that went, can't you? Hey guys, <coughs> come <coughs> look at dad over here. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backwards and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so that they could not see their father naked. You see, the Hebrew word for cover means to keep hidden, to keep secret. A holiday movie that many of us enjoy is called It's a Wonderful Life. And there's a scene in that movie where Mr. Gower makes a misstep, a really significant misstep. Saddened by the death of his own son and distracted by that, he actually puts poison in the medicine for another. And George, young George, is supposed to deliver that medicine. And he doesn't deliver it in a timely fashion, so Mr. Gower gets mad at him. But George interrupts the beating that he was receiving and says, Mr. Gower, you don't understand what you've done. You've put poison in that medicine. And Mr. Gower in that moment is exposed. But George, even as a young boy, says, I won't tell anyone. No one was hurt by it. George headed that off, and he kept that a secret for the rest of his life. Now, what did he do? He covered Mr. Gower. And how important for us, like Noah's two sons, Shem and Japheth, to cover the mistakes of others rather than expose them, ridicule them, and mock them for it. Proverbs Chapter 17 and verse 9 says, Whoever would foster love covers over an offense. But whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Now I want to take us now to really the key story that we're going to deal with this morning. And that is the story of what happens in the upper room of John 13. But I'm going to get there through Luke chapter 7. Because in Luke, excuse me, Luke 22. Because in Luke 22, an assignment is given. In Luke 22, beginning in verse 7, the day of unleavened bread had come, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent, and I want you to remember these names, Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it, they ask. And Jesus gives them instructions. So it's their responsibility to make preparations for the most significant meal of the year in Jewish culture. The end of verse 13 says, so they prepared the Passover. So they went and prepared the Passover. Now, if you're cooking a meal for someone who is your leader you probably take hospitality pretty seriously. But hospitality in our culture doesn't really even compare to hospitality in Jesus' culture. Hospitality was a huge deal, a huge core value, beginning all the way back with Abraham in Genesis 18 when he actually washed the feet of his three guests. So to practice hospitality becomes a really strong core value. As a matter of fact, when Paul is doing a transition in the book of Romans and moving off of duty to na- uh, excuse me, doctrine to now duty, moving from the things we believe to how we behave, beginning in chapter 12, he initiates a conversation and actually talks about hospitality being such a big deal. He says in Romans 12, 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice 
hospitality. So understanding that hospitality was a higher level core value in Jesus' day helps us. And then understanding what hospitality looked like in that culture. You see, it was the responsibility of the one who was hosting to clean and refresh those from their travels, to, respo- res- to show respect and love for them. And as one of the most important Jewish values, it included to wash their feet, minimally to set out water for them to wash their own feet. You see, I've worn shoes today. I don't have open sandals today. And I walked on either grass or on asphalt to get here. So my feet aren't very dirty right now. But can you imagine walking on the hardened ground of dusty Palestine with open-toed sandals and arriving at a destination, not just moving from your car to the door, but maybe traveling miles and getting to a destination? It becomes so important to make sure that you refresh and clean your guests this sign of respect to wash their feet. So with that being understood as a core value, an important core value, we're going to even see in Luke chapter 7 how much Jesus esteemed this and identified this as a value. In Luke chapter 7, in verse 39, when Jesus is at the home of a Pharisee by the name of Simon, Simon mutters sort of under his breath, she's a sinner. Who's a sinner? The one who came in and washed Jesus' feet. And Simon's muttering, if if he had known who she was. And in verse 44, we see that then Jesus turned toward the woman who had washed his feet. And he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house, you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. So now that we have sort of elevated this value of hospitality, and in particular this idea of foot washing that was to be done by the host, let's jump into the story in John chapter 13, where now they've arrived at the room that has been prepared by Peter and John. And they're having the meal together. It's in John chapter 13. And at the beginning of the chapter, we see that it was just before the Passover festival. So this is the actual meal. Verse 2 says, the evening meal was in progress. Verse 4 says, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he, this is Jesus, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, a couple things should jump out at you here. One thing that should jump out at you is that Jesus actually had to fill the basin himself. Peter had neglected the responsibility of actually providing water for his guests. And you don't let the main guest, the rabbi, Jesus, go by without his feet being clean. And certainly appropriate for you to wash them yourself. So what does Jesus do? Well, before we answer that question, let's contemplate what could Jesus have done? Yo, Peter. And you could just play it out, can't you? He could have thrown him under the bus, even though buses really weren't invented yet at that time. But you know what I mean. He could have insisted that Peter get up and fulfill his responsibilities. He could have criticized Peter for not fulfilling that responsibility. John as well. I'm using Peter as an example because we're going to see some things from Peter in this story. But instead, he does what? He conceals it. He hides it. He covers it. And you know what else he does? He actually fulfills the responsibility that Peter neglected to do himself. 
Not only, I mean, I mean, when someone spills something in front of you, not only do you not laugh at them, not only do you not criticize them, but you actually go get something and clean it up for them. Isn't that like Jesus? I mean, this is an illustration here. But think about how Jesus covers us. What does Romans tell us about sin and its wages? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. You know, someone had to pay for your sin and my sin. And it was Jesus who paid the price. You see, it was our responsibility to experience death because of our sin. But rather than leave us exposed, rather than leave us vulnerable, Jesus said, I'll cover that one. And look what he did for us. He died on the cross to cover our sin, to provide forgiveness for us, to keep that hidden as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. Oh, what a beautiful Jesus. What a beautiful Savior that we have. And he's modeling that for them right here in this very story. You'll note that as he goes to Peter... Peter resists him at first. Verse 8, Peter, as he comes to him to wash his feet, we'll go we'll back up to verse 6. He came to Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Uh, you don't realize what's going on here, Peter. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you make a mistake and someone tries to cover you with grace and love, you can become a little bit self-protective, a little bit prideful, not willing to humble yourself and to be covered, or maybe feeling so unworthy of the love of that that there's nothing that they can do that's going to cover you. And that's kind of what happens next. When Jesus says, hey, if you don't let me wash my, your feet, you got no part with me. We're out of fellowship. And Peter says, okay, then give me the whole bath. Give me the whole bath. And Jesus says, no, you've already been washed. You don't need to be washed. You've already been saved. You don't need to be saved again. But i got to clean up what's this misstep that you made. So there's sometimes that we have difficulty being loved in our weakness. We might flinch and become self-protective, unwilling to humble ourselves, or we might feel so unworthy so not only is today, I think, a lesson in covering others, but it's also a lesson in allowing others to cover us and be humble enough to receive that gracious movement that they make for, toward us. That's what we have to do with God, right? I mean, God doesn't make it super complicated. You know, we don't have to pay a price for our forgiveness. It's not of works lest any man should boast, Paul says in Ephesians 2. But we do need to humble ourselves and to receive it when it's extended to us. Whether we feel worthy of it or not. You know, Jesus didn't even mention to Peter what he was doing for him. I thought it was pretty clear in what he was doing. I think Peter got the message, don't you? I think Peter understood it. And it was a few verses later that Jesus would say in John 13, verses 34 and 35, don't miss this one, please. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. Wait a minute, that's not a new command. Right? That goes, that goes all the way back to Leviticus 19. That's not a new command. Jesus repeated that in Matthew chapter 22 as the greatest commandment is to love one another. So what's new about this, Jesus? He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. You see, the old command was love one another as you love yourself. Now Jesus says, no, let's take that a notch higher. You love one another as I have loved you. Cover one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Everyone will know you are my disciples if you cover one another. 
It was shortly after John 13 that we read Jesus' prayer in John 17. As he prays that we would be unified, that we would love one another, that we would cover one another. And he prays to the Father in verse 23, I pray that they would come to complete unity so that the world would know that I've loved them and sent my son. You see, how we get along with one another has evangelistic implications to a watching world. It adds credibility to our message. That's why this is so important that we would cover one another. Oh, I want to do this better, to cover one another. I think Peter wanted to do it better, too. After Peter saw what Jesus did, I think this message stuck with him. Why? Because 30 years later, as he's summarizing his letter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, he says, the end of all things is near. And then in verse 8, he says, above all, love each other deeply because love, what? Covers a multitude of sins. We're largely just talking about covering over mistakes, missteps, personal idiosyncrasies. But the word of God is asking us to cover the sins of one another. And I think this was still on Peter's mind because of what he said in the very next verse. Offer hospitality to one another. Wow. Maybe he remembered his misstep in hospitality and how Jesus covered him and he wanted us to cover one another. To cover one another. To protect one another. Sins, missteps, vulnerabilities. You know, one of the things Tracy and I do from time to time is we'll look at one another and teasingly say, we're exactly alike. And the reason we do that is because we couldn't be any more different than two people. And we find humor in that. Tracy's very much an empath. And I'm more fire on the uh, analytical side of things, thinking things through. And sometimes Tracy will make a decision and I'll feel an impulse to question it. So why, why would, help me understand this. Why, why would you, do, and Tracy at times will just look at me and say, just love me. <laughs> just cover me, right? We don't always have to address, confront, resolve, enter conflict over every little thing. Uh, I'm, you know I'm preaching to myself now, right? <laughs> Dr. David Carlson wrote a book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, subtitled, and it's all small stuff, right? So maybe we should, like that great Disney movie, Frozen, <laughs> maybe we should sometimes just, what? Wow. Just let it go sometimes. Don't always sweat the small stuff. Like Peter, we are under God's cover, his protection, his forgiveness. He is our refuge. Listen to Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. You know, that word cover there in the Hebrew can carry another meaning of screening. A screen is, a, is something that can occur in basketball. I was going to bring up a couple gentlemen and actually illustrate this for you, but, but for time, we're just going to put up a, 
a, a picture of Draymond Green and Steph Curry and show you what a screen looks like in basketball. It's where one offensive player stands in the way of another defender who's defending someone. So that the, when, the, when the offensive player goes by the screener and stays close to the screener, the defender can't come with them. That's called a screen. And that can free them up to do what they're called to do, which is shoot the ball. One of the keys is you've got to stay really close to your screener in order to get freed up for the defender. The word cover means to screen. God is screening for us. We don't even know some of the attacks that are coming toward us, and God has stepped in and screened for us. But here's a key in a screen. If you provide too much of a gap, the defender comes with them. You've got to get close to your screener. And Jesus is our screener who sits at the right hand of the Father while Satan, while the devil, according to Revelation 12.10, that accuser of the brothers and sisters, he accuses us before God day and night. So you want to be covered by God? Stay close to your screener. Amen? Amen? I, I said today's message was in alignment with the second saying of a gracist. I will cover you. A couple quotes from Dr. Anderson in this book that are helpful to us. The saying, this saying of a gracist is in alignment with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 23, which is the basis from it. I like the rendering in the NLT, which reads, we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. You want to be under the cover. We all have parts that we don't want others to see those private things we may be wrestling with or battling with, and we're to cover one another in those things. Our pastor writes, the call to cover one another is the call to express godly attitudes before judging or exposing areas of the body that are blemished or unseemly. He says, power down and cover those in the body of Christ with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Protect the dignity of others. In the midst of a cancel culture, let's be a cover culture. Two simple applications from trying to be a cover culture. Number one, let it go. Let it go. Don't sweat the small stuff. Live in tolerance and acceptance and allow for the margins of mistakes in the lives of others as they are trying to, everyone's trying to do their best. Let people move forward socially, culturally, spiritually. Help them in that journey rather than canceling them in that journey. And then application number two, humbly accept the covering of others. And especially the covering of God. You know, Peter initially said to Jesus when Jesus wanted to cover him, his misstep and wash his feet, no, I'm good. Humble ourselves and allow for God's covering. The main covering God wants to do for you and for me is to allow us to appropriate what he did on the cross for our spiritual lives. Humble ourselves and receive the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. Paul would write, and I'll close with this, in Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. And in saying those words, Paul was quoting David when David experienced the abundant, amazing grace of God and the forgiveness of his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. So let's all stay under the cover. Let's all cover one another. Amen. <laughs>